Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cryonicists React. This time, we're reacting to Cryogenics, Short-Term Possibility or Pipe Dream by the Science of Science Fiction channel. We are three cryonicists who work in the industry, know the industry, do stuff in the cryonics community, and we know a lot about cryonics. We're here to tell you why this video is not fully accurate as to the science, economics, or anything else about cryonics. So obviously cryonics is a pretty niche space at the moment. So the purpose of this series is to look at different videos and kind of content that people have done on the topic and um, correct some of the inaccurate things that they say, both from the science to the economics and everything in between and clear up any misconceptions about cryonics. The premise of cryogenics is simple. Freeze a person's body upon death, then saw them out once the cure for whatever killed them has been discovered. Okay, we're just seven seconds in and he has already said something incorrect. So cryogenics is a branch of physics that studies material in extremely low temperatures. Um, it's has nothing to do with preserving humans. What he's referring to is cryonics, um, which also deals with low temperatures and the terms sound kind of similar, but otherwise they're completely different things. Cryonics is the practice of putting people on pause in the hopes of them being able to be revived uh, and, and unpaused in the future by people in the future. Cryogenics is not that. So <laughs> yeah. Google is our friend, people. Let's 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 Google stuff. All right, but but you know maybe he'll get better. Could be cancer, an infectious disease, or in the case of one C. Montgomery Burns, seventeen stab wounds to the back. <laughs> On the surface, that makes a lot of sense, but to many, the logic behind it is only surface. Among mainstream scientists, cryogenics is viewed at best as pseudoscience and at worst as outright quackery. That's not true. Among mainstream scientists, I. I Mainstream science is is typically doesn't have much to say on cryonics because it's the practice of doing something in the hopes of, you know, in the future, there's going to be good technology and all this. It's very speculative. But scientists, when they're asked about this, are like, yeah, I mean, that's a it's a gamble. It's a it's a it's a hope. Maybe it'll work. Maybe it won't. But the, the science is 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 pretty clear. It's a speculative idea that in the future we're going to have a way to uh, undo the damage that is done by the freezing process, the vitrification process. So uh, it's certainly not pseudoscience or, or, or yeah. quackery. Yeah, I, I, I think that's, uh, that, is, that is inaccurate. Yeah, there was actually an open letter signed by dozens of doctors and scientists, um, I think led by Ashman DeWolf, which kind of said, hey, cryonics is a legit thing that should be taken seriously. It's not pseudoscience. Obviously, it's understandable why a lot of people, when they first hear about this, might be skeptical because most of science deals with very concrete data and things that are proven, and it should be that way, right? But that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have space for kind of more long-term scientific visions. And, you know, even if it's not possible today, there's no fundamental biological reason why it's impossible to one day revive cryopreserved patients. It's a scientifically informed prediction that in the future, technology is going to be good enough to revive us and undo the damage done. That's that that sounds like science to me. Challenging the views of mainstream science isn't inherently bad. It just requires a higher level of evidentiary proof, a standard that is rarely met. So is cryogenics the next germ theory or is it the next phrenology? Let's find out. History. The first experiments using cryopreservation on human cells began in 1954, but we're going to circle back to those experiments later. See an app called History. You'll need to get that from the App Store first. <laughs> Speaking of science of science fiction, where is my Star Trek like computer rather than this sh? Why are you even listening to me, Siri, you freak? But we'll circle back to those experiments later. It wasn't until April of 1966 that the first full human body was frozen. This early attempt was destined to fail because the woman in question had already been dead and embalmed for two months before being frozen. <laughs> It's not going to work out. They're not going to be able to thaw up. Embalming is bad for you. Embalming fluid is 
formaldehyde is extremely poisonous and it should be clear from the outset that this attempt was just going to be a non-starter when was thawed out and buried by relatives shortly after being frozen however this may have just been an attempt to see what would happen to the cells of a human body when frozen rather than a genuine effort to preserve the woman for a later revival something that would have been objectively impossible in her state objectively impossible that's a bit of a strong statement but okay i'll give very 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 unlikely but i can already kind of tell that he's using very definitive language which is something i would maybe not think is the best approach when you're talking about science it's a bit unscientific of him the first body frozen with the intent of being thawed and brought to life was that of psychology professor James Bedford. Now, one of the people responsible for this historic event was Robert Nelson. Robert was incredibly fascinated with the field of cryogenics, and after joining the Cryonic Society of California, he was quickly voted in as president. For those that would want to argue against cryonics being quackery, this uh, was a poorly thought out vote. Perhaps none of the society's members knew it at the time, but Robert wasn't a scientist. He hadn't even graduated high school. He was just a TV <laughs> It was just a TV repairman that thought cryonics was interesting and got in way over his head. Bodies were frozen and sent to him, forcing him to store them in boxes laced with styrofoam and filled with dry ice. And he did this all in his friend's garage. He really hadn't thought it through. Eventually, he rented a vault to store the bodies in. The money quickly dried up. The upfront fees for freezing a person weren't extraordinarily high, and it turned out random strangers or even family members didn't want to offer up money to keep dead bodies frozen in the hopes that someday they'd come back to life. The money dried up, and Robert locked the vault and walked away, leaving nine bodies to thaw and decompose. James Bedford, who is still being preserved today, remains the only person frozen before 1974 who has not been thawed. Once word of what happened broke, the families of the frozen subject sued Nelson and won a total of $800,000. Robert changed his name and disappeared, though he re-emerged in the 2010s to write his autobiography. <laughs> Jesus, that's a story. Freezing people is not easy. I would love to say that despite the rocky start, things have turned around. And well, to some degree they have. Rather than just a handful of people stored in a garage, there are now roughly 500 people cryogenically frozen worldwide, with the vast majority of these being in the United States. In some cases, it is only the brain that is frozen, rather than the entire body, perhaps in the hope that the brain can be thawed and their consciousness uploaded into a machine or put into a new body. Okay, this is a small point, but... I think he's referring to neuropriopreservation, which is what Alcor offers, one of their services, um, which is head only. But saying it's brain only is slightly inaccurate. Um, so Tomorrow Bio in Europe recently started offering brain only, but that was only announced after this video came out. So I think that was a slight misunderstanding. But it is very similar. So maybe I can give him a pass on this. Yeah, it's pretty close. However, with no plans to thaw anyone out, and indeed with no idea how to even do it, it's hard to say that it's turned around much. Well, we do actually have some ideas. Um, there was a book published in 2022 this year called Cryostasis Revival, which reviews some of the possible ways in pretty high detail of how patients could be revived using nanotechnology. Um, but I will certainly admit we are definitely not anywhere close to do that. And all the kind of details of how that would work, we don't know. But that's also kind of the point of cryonics. If we knew how to do all this, and if our technology was that advanced, then we wouldn't need this in the first place, right? The point of cryonics is, hey, um, you can't be saved by today's technology anymore, so you die. But our definition of death has changed over time as our medical technology has advanced. So what's considered dead today might not be considered dead in the future. But obviously, we can't revive people yet. Otherwise, well, we wouldn't have had this problem in the first place. The, uh, the tome that Becca mentioned is indeed a 700-page manifesto on the actual science of what's been going on for decades of research in this field for people who want to argue that uh, this is an unscientific field, you kind of have to confront this, <laughs> this, this kind of manuscript. I also want to add that there has been improvement. There's an adjacent field to, to cryonics, um, which is organ suspension. And there has been research with organs, a rabbit kidney, for instance, with the work of Greg Fay, uh, that part of the problem with, with revival is the rewarming process. And there has been research on rewarming cryogenically frozen organs. And so rapid warming, uh, warming using kind of a microwave type technology, these kinds of uh, experiments have been done and successfully 
revived a rabbit kidney in one of them. And so to say that we haven't made progress on thinking about revival is false from that standpoint as well. The science. As the title of Robert's book may indicate, freezing people is indeed not easy. To start, the person needs to be already dead. Because it is largely regarded as fringe pseudoscience, particularly from a legal standpoint, death is a requirement. Performing the procedure on a living person would have serious ethical and legal implications. It could also definitely be called murder. But after they are dead, a person can choose to have their remains handled as they wish. At least sometimes they can. In many countries, the practice is outright illegal, and the only acceptable method for dealing with a person's remains, a burial, cremation, and donating to science. Like, real science, not cryogenic science. Uh, it's kind of a weird point because that is actually how cryopreservation works in most countries. Is It's a scientific body donation. This is possible in the US and in most European countries. Outside of that, I'm not so familiar, but in most of the Western countries, it is possible through scientific body donation. And, you know, every time that chronics has been challenged in court, it's been held up. So clearly the court disagrees that this is not real science. It is completely legal in almost every Western country. Yeah. Once the person has died, it's important to act quickly. Decomposition begins immediately, and the brain decomposes faster than the rest of the body. The process can sometimes begin oh, within minutes of death, minimizing any amount of decomposition that may take place. I would like to point out, though, that this is one thing that he actually gets right like very right decomposition is bad and the moment somebody dies their cells start to start to break down uh from not having the chemicals that are necessary to maintain uh the life of those cells oxygen being one of the obvious ones but there's others and so the faster that you start reducing the temperature of those cells the longer they will be able to remain alive uh, until you reduce it down so low that, of course, the cell is effectively on pause, which is what cryonics is. Yeah, usually people can last around six minutes without oxygen before their brain starts getting irreparable damage. Um, but you'll hear a case of there was a woman, I believe, in Norway who fell into a frozen lake. Um, she was under for 40 minutes and then was brought out and had a complete recovery. So cooling the temperature slows the metabolism, which means that the cells need less oxygen to survive. So it makes a huge difference in how quickly the cells degrade. From there, it's just a simple matter of freezing the body safely. And if you have any idea to how to do that, well, we'd love to hear it, because the companies that do this freezing, they haven't figured it out yet either. One of the main problems with freezing a human body is that we're about 60% water. When water freezes, it turns into ice crystals. When ice crystals form within your cells, they rupture the cell membranes, damaging them irreparably. The original technique to try and avoid this was known as slow programmable freezing, in which the body was slowly frozen over several hours to try and prevent these ice crystals from forming. In the mid-1980s, a new technique was developed that improved upon this. Rather than freezing the body as slowly as possible, scientists went the complete opposite direction and decided to freeze it as fast as possible and using a process known as vitrification. This flash freezing process involves cryoprotectant substances used to protect biological tissue from freezing damage. These exist in nature in certain Arctic and Antarctic animals, so it seems like a natural course of action. In high enough concentrations, cryoprotectants can stop the formation of ice crystals completely. With the hope of being able to store transplantable organs for later to use, the first cryoprotectants that allowed for vitrification at slow coolant rates were developed in the 1990s. These solutions were also tested on animal brains, which were frozen and then thawed, and there was absolutely no damage resulting from the ice crystals. Truly, this was science at its best, except for the fact that there was severe cellular damage resulting from dehydration and from how highly toxic the cryoprotectants are. I would say he's, he's accurate about that. Um, the cryoprotectants themselves are toxic. But the toxicity that's caused from things like dehydration and the other problems is easier to solve than, or you know, quite quite likely going to be a lot easier to solve in the future than the damage caused physically by the ice crystal formation. Yeah, and there is actually a part of the procedure that is specifically done to mitigate this toxicity. So it's not like something you can't do anything about. Um, so when a patient is first perfused with cryoprotectants, it's not the full concentration. It's actually a very, very diluted concentration um, while the patient is still cooling down. And as you continue to lower the, uh, the temperature of the patient, you increase the concentration. And the reason you do that is because 
as the person becomes colder, the cell's metabolism slows down. And if this metabolism is slower, then it's not metabolizing the cryoprotectant as much. So if it's very, very low temperature, then it's not going to be metabolizing that super toxic cryoprotectant. So if you do this really well, the cells are not actually absorbing that much of the cryoprotectant. Even if a better solution is found, every single person currently frozen is already going to be damaged beyond repair. The brain and its neural circuits are simply too damaged from vitrification, even if the cells weren't torn open by ice crystals. I'm just not really getting on board with his certainty here. Um, to say that they're irreparably damaged and beyond repair, um, there's no reason to say that. We actually, the answer is actually unknown at this point of whether or not that kind of damage can be repaired. And actually in organ preservation, we've seen good evidence that, you know, with the right kinds of cryoprotectant procedures that organs can function again upon revival. And so understandably the brain is more complex. It is more delicate, um, but there's no reason to be certain that there's any kind of permanent damage there. This is, this is a little bit like somebody back in the day saying that once a person's heart stopped, obviously their body is you know, irreparably beyond repair and they are completely and fully dead. Uh, turns out that we figured out how to revive that person's heart even after it stopped. And it turns out they weren't, you know, fully dead and we could bring them back. So it just seems like incredibly um, short-sighted to imagine that even in whatever it could be, a long time, hundreds of years before this person's, uh, you know, return from cryo cryostasis, that we simply would not have even con possibly imagined a way to solve the problem that uh, that led to this person's demise. I mean, there's also the possibility of maintaining the person's identity and uploading the person or in some way uh, reviving them. That's a science fiction kind of scenario. And so this idea that we have to repair everything in its place is uh, not really the full picture. Yeah. So when he says irreparable damage here, what he really means is it's irreparable today, which is totally true, but that doesn't necessarily mean it will always be irreparable. So I think people often get stuck in this kind of mindset of only thinking in like terms of their own life and maybe generation before and a generation after. And they don't really see how far science has come and how far it could still potentially go, right? A lot of the procedures that were considered impossible in the past, like a heart transplant, are now standard procedure. We don't really think about them as that miraculous, but for most of human history, it would have been a completely insane prospect. So perhaps in the future, the kind of repair necessary to repair a patient will be incredibly standard. We just don't know at this point. The cost for cryogenic freezing ranges from $28,000 to $200,000, and the money is typically taken from a life insurance policy. In addition, those wanting to reserve this service must pay an annual fee ranging from $120 to $700 per year. This means that as long as there are more people that want to be frozen, there will always be a steady influx of cash. And let's just say that that description sounds absolutely nothing like a Ponzi scheme for legal reasons, and we'll move on from there. But, uh, yeah, not all companies uh, charge annual membership dues. That's incorrect. Yeah. And also this idea of how patients are maintained as a kind of Ponzi scheme is just completely inaccurate. Um, so for example, Alcor and Tomorrow Bio, they have very similar structures where the majority of the funds um, that pays out in the life insurance goes to, uh, in Alcor's case, it's called the Patient Care Trust. And in Tomorrow's case, it's called the Tomorrow Patient Foundation. And those are separate organizations that have the sole responsibility of keeping patients secure and cryopreserved. Um, and they do that by putting the money into very, very low risk investments, things like government bonds that have a yield goal of like one to 2% per year. And that is more than enough to pay for the running costs of keeping patients cryopreserved. And it has been successful with Alcor keeping all their patients cryopreserved for the last 50 years, despite multiple financial crises. So it seems to work pretty well. So this idea that new patients are paying for current patients is just not true. And even if the operational businesses were to go out of business at some point, the patients wouldn't be affected because those funds are completely separate. I mean, a lot of thought went into setting this up because the people that work for these organizations all want to be cryopreserved themselves. So obviously you don't want to rely on a Ponzi scheme. So I'm not really sure where he got this idea, to be honest, but 
maybe he just assumed that's how it worked, but that's not really the case at all. His, his definition of Ponzi scheme is very strange. I, I think he 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 tried to define Ponzi scheme as a company that requires uh, to keep has to keep getting revenue in the door to function or operate. I think that's any company like <laughs> Apple or whatever. You know, all that how do how, they're they're only around because they keep getting revenue. But it's funny, cryonics orgs are one of the very few orgs out there, like like you're saying, Becca, that uh, don't require that. <laughs> They're actually able to continue to provide the service of storing people uh, in, in cryosuspension without any new influx of money because of the fact that they got that uh, a large sum in the beginning, which they then um, uh, 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 take the interest from and, and, and get returns from in perpetuity. So it's a, sort of the opposite of a Ponzi scheme. You know, it, it, a normal company would be much closer to a Ponzi scheme under his definition. I also think it's worth pointing out uh, that with modern technology, with the modern Dewar technology and the use of liquid nitrogen, that uh, keeping chronic patients cold is actually a lot cheaper than you might think. Um, somewhere in the neighborhood of three to $500 a year uh, for the cost of materials. So if you are thinking of this as some very high-tech, uh, futuristic, rich kind of thing that you're doing. Yes, the medical procedure component is expensive. Um, but if you think about what you cost to the organization on an ongoing basis after that, it's actually very cheap. The technology is still relatively new, and so few people have had the opportunity to be frozen that there is still a bit of a novelty, misty, and naive hope revolving around cryogenics. However, how long can this realistically last for? 50 years? 200? How long will companies be able to support keeping these dead bodies frozen as it becomes more and more clear that they will never be revived? Unless through some absolute miracle someone actually figures out how to thaw out and revive a dead body, public interest in these companies is eventually going to wane, and there's going to be a lot of thought out corpses that need burying pronto well it's already lasted 50 years so yeah you can there's plenty of companies uh there's many examples of companies around the world um, that have lasted for hundreds of years and they were not in a sense designed to last for that kind of long term they just happen to be able to do so uh, but these cryonics companies have been designed now the, the ones that have existed now for, for like Alcor for decades and the newer ones that are modeled after it in many ways um, have, have been designed to last for a long, long, long time. They've been made very stable um, and uh, financially stable, stable in terms of their corporate governance. So if any, if any kind of company would be able to withstand a test of time, it would be these companies now. Yeah, and I just wanted to point out that Alcor isn't the only company um, offering Chronix that's been around for a long time. Um, Chronix Institute is another one that has almost been around for 50 years. So kind of the two largest organizations in the U.S. have both been around for decades. No patients had to be unfrozen due to finances. So, so far, so good. Wrap up. So, the year is 2450, and despite all the odds, you have been successfully thawed from your cryogenic storage facility and revived. You were 87 years old when you died in the hospital bed of natural causes. You felt the world fading away, and for the next 400 years, there was nothing. Suddenly, your brain was reactivated as your body sprang back to life. You again awake up in a hospital bed, disorientated at first, but feeling fine. The doctors try to explain to you what's happening, but you can't understand what anyone's saying. English is a dead language now, with Luxembourgish having taken on as the universal standard. <laughs> you lift yourself out of the bed, you wander out of the room, making your way to the main entrance. You gaze out as flying cars speed through the sky and children chase each other on hoverboards. Yes! A man bumps your shoulder by accident as he rushes to work, followed by his two metallic android servants. Every science fiction fantasy you've ever had seems to have become a reality, but it's too much to take in. You feel your chest tight and your arm goes numb from the terrifying shock of the world you've awoken to. You collapse to the ground, having only experienced a few moments of a future society, and the world fades away. Best 200 grand I ever spent! I feel like he's trying to, you know, engage the audience here with like just a light kind of story that's fun. And I don't want to uh, be too critical of that. Um, but if we're going to get technical, uh, Alcor does have um, a patient revival fund that includes this idea of rehabilitation and integrating you back into the world. Because yes, that will be difficult in some ways. Uh, but cryonics is partially for people who have a spirit of adventure. Um, it, that might be ex what he just described might be terrifying to one person, but completely exciting to another. Yeah. And the good news is if revival works out, 
well, there's going to be hundreds or even potentially thousands or hundreds of thousands of people that are in the same boat as you, right? You wouldn't be the sole person to buy. It's very unlikely. So you kind of have other people to lean on in this scenario. And just a small point, but if your heart stopped, if they can revive you from cryopreservation, <laughs> that's not going to kill you. I think you would be fine. <laughs> but also in, in general, um, there's this interesting thing. He's not really doing it so much here. Um, it's a, He's mostly portraying a generally positive future. But a lot of times when people think about revival from cryonics, they assume kind of this worst, they have this like sci-fi dystopian vision. Um, and they cite that as a reason why they would never want to do it. And on first glance, that might seem like it makes sense. But if you really think about it, what they're basically saying is that they would rather be dead than have the chance of experiencing a future that isn't that great, right? So, okay, imagine this. Technically, it's possible that tonight when you go to sleep, a crazy person will drug you and drag you to their basement and torture you for the next few years and then kill you. Like it is technically possible, right? So to avoid that chance by their logic, you should just kill yourself today. That doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Like just because there is a chance that something in the future is not gonna be the best experience doesn't mean you should die, right? I'm not saying that if revival works out, I'm definitely gonna wake up in this utopia, right? Maybe there's gonna be problems. I don't think everything would be perfect, but the point is, is that whatever I find, I think that that's worth experiencing. I think life is pretty cool. It's called adventure, exploration, the future, the undiscovered country. Interesting place to look forward to seeing. Now that may all sound a bit dramatic, but well, don't worry about it because it's never gonna fucking happen. Cryogenics as a means to freeze and then revive an entire human being is an absolute pipe dream. It can't be performed until you're dead. And once you are, the process damages your body beyond repair. We should all just accept the fact that we're gonna die someday and get on with our lives rather than endlessly pursuing the boring, torturous drudgery that would be immortality. I don't know, I find it all pessimistic. <laughs> I wanna be frozen. Come on. Thanks for watching. Boring, torturous drudgery. That would be immortality. Boring, torturous drudgery. That would be immortality. Could you like, could you imagine the future where we have flying cars, we're traveling to the stars, uh, you know, we're, 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 we're meeting and befriending all kinds of people. We're meeting the aliens, you know, and we're seeing what they're like and, and, and what are, what are their existences like? And he thinks of that as like boring, torturous drudgery. I mean, maybe maybe after a billion years, when you get really tired of things and you're like, yeah, okay, I'll I'll, I'll turn myself off now. I, I won't continue to exist. But like, how how unimaginative does someone have to be to think that being able to see the future is going to be boring, torturous drudgery? Like, imagine if you had taken. Uh, you know, some interesting character from the past, like a Nikola Tesla or or a Benjamin Franklin or something, you'd brought him to the present and you like woke him up and you were like, hey, you're in the future. Are they going to be like, oh, you know, geez, this is so boring. Just, just, you know, whatever. Give me some, you know, give me a lethal injection. I'm out. No, they'd, you know, they'd, they'd go to Wikipedia, or teach them how to use Wikipedia. And they go to Wikipedia and they start reading his stuff and learning about stuff. And they'd watch shows and TV. Oh my God. And flying through the air in these metal cans that don't fall out of the air and like that is really interesting how can anybody think that there isn't like that the future that being around for a potentially really long time is going to be boring torturous drudgery that that to me is where this guy like really takes the cake yeah cryonics isn't about immortality per se right it's just about having the chance to choose how long you want to live um whether that's a hundred years, a thousand or whatever, right? I think that people don't really realize how much they equate normal with good. So for the majority of human history, it was very normal for people to die when they were 30. Like the average life expectancy was way lower than it is today. If someone to die today at 30, everyone would agree, wow, that was a tragedy they died too soon. And in that same way, just because it's currently normal to die in your 80s doesn't mean there's anything inherently good or right about that. So, you know, he might think like, ah, you should be okay with 80 years, but 
why? I mean, if there's a potential to live longer, I think people actually can have meeting, meaningful lives beyond their 30s and potentially beyond their 80s. He also says that we should um, accept death as if in some way by being a crown assist that we're suffering somehow by like this, we haven't accepted it. And so we're doing cryonics and it's, it's a bad experience for us. And I actually think that's a misconception. I think when you sign up for cryonics, you end up with hope, you end up more connected to the far future, you end up uh, thinking about, you know, long term of humanity, you you end up with a lot of positive emotions, um, and, and no confused suffering <laughs> um, that he seems to be suggesting. Yeah, it's almost uh, when you say accept death, I'm thinking like, actually, Cryonesis is a group of people that accept two different things. Like one is that the future can potentially be really interesting really awesome, something worth seeing, something worth experiencing, and, and it would be great to, to be around and to see that. And death is actually going to happen for sure, basically, uh, unless you do something about it. Like death is death is there. Don't forget about death. Don't don't neglect the fact that I mean sure, even if you're young, tomorrow you could be hit by, you know, the proverbial bus and and that's not good because then you don't get to see all that amazing stuff. You don't get to experience all that and experiencing that, seeing that, being a part of that matters. It's worth something. And we should take the steps necessary to avoid this very real problem of death if it is possible. And we all are taking a bet in the hopes that we can avoid it. Look, cryonics might not be for everybody, right? We don't know what the probability is that it will succeed. It's somewhere above zero, but whether that's just barely above that or much higher, there's no way for us to say that. But hopefully uh, people will get a better understanding of what cryonics is because we believe people should make the informed decision, right? And not just turn away because they watch some videos that kind of misled on what cryonics actually is. So everyone should have the opportunity to choose for themselves whether they want to take the chance of a lifetime.